In this video, we'll go over everything you need to know how to start up a serverless endpoint and start receiving requests in less than 10 minutes. Stay tuned. All right, to give a quick review of how serverless works, the general workflow works like this. The developer or end user makes an API call via HTTP to the prescribed URL for the endpoint. Now, here's something important to understand. All requests first enter a queue. When that first request comes in, it immediately triggers a worker to wake up and handle it. The endpoint manages this pool of workers, and subsequent requests may trigger additional workers to spin up based on your scaling configuration, which includes things like queue delay settings and request total thresholds. We'll dive deep into scaling strategies in a future video, but for now, just know that the queue is a central hub for all incoming work. The GPUs that are allocated are designated by you when you set up the endpoint. You can define whatever GPU specs you'd like the endpoint to use, and this can range from budget-friendly options to cutting-edge GPUs depending on what your workload needs. Once a worker picks up a request from the queue, then it executes its handler function, provides a result back to the serverless system, and then eventually shuts down after a period of inactivity. The result gets stored and is available for retrieval through the status endpoint, which you can pull to get your completed results. The upshot of all this is that you save on all the overhead of spinning up and shutting down pods. Because serverless is a far leaner build, you spend a far greater proportion of your GPU budget doing what you pay to do, rather than waiting for infrastructure to start up and spin down. Now, let's talk about what actually runs on these workers, and this is what a handler function does. The entire workload is contained within a single function, although you can, of course, define other functions as you normally would in programming. The handler is the entry point. It's what gets called when a worker picks up a job from the queue. Any tasks within the function will execute as program after the handler is invoked, which is done by runpod.serverless.start. This is a magic line that tells a runpod SDK to start pulling the queue for jobs and to send results back to the serverless system when tasks complete. Your handler function receives a job object, which contains the input parameters sent with the API request. You process whatever you need to process. Maybe it's running inference on a model, processing images, or any other GPU intensive task, and then you return the results. The SDK handles all the communication back to the serverless system, making those results available through the status API. Now, because serverless workers run off of Docker images just like pods, you'll also need a Docker file. And here's a very basic bare bones example to get you started. You take a base image, you set a working directory, you bring in your requirements.txt and handler.py files, install your dependencies, and then have it run the Python file that starts your handler. The Docker file is really just packaging up your code and dependencies into a reproducible environment that can spin up quickly on any GPU worker. Keep your images as lean as possible, only include what you actually need, because smaller images mean faster cold starts, which we'll see in action later. Once you have your project that you want to deploy, you've got three primary methods of getting it into an endpoint. The first method is that you can build your own Docker image locally. The pros of this approach are significant. You have complete control over what goes into the image, you can test locally before deployment, and you have full control over the build process. You're not constrained by build timeouts because since your local build can take as long as you need it to. On the flip side, you're also responsible for providing your own environment as well as the infrastructure, which includes building the image and uploading it to a container registry like Docker Hub. And when your image size gets to 50 gigs or more, this could be very difficult to iterate on with a home internet connection. Pushing a 50 gig image on residential upload speeds can take hours. The second method is using GitHub integration, which is what we'll use in this example. This is great for rapid iteration because you can just push to GitHub and the endpoint automatically builds and deploys. However, there are some limitations here. Builds do need to complete within less than 2.5 hours, and your final image size needs to be under 80 gigs. For a complete list of limitations, check out the RunPod docs at the GitHub integration page, and I'll put that link in the description. The third method is deploying pre-built images from the RunPod hub. These are very similar to pod templates in that the RunPod community has set up pre-configured packages for common use cases. This is perfect when you want to quickly spin up something like VLLM, Stable Diffusion, or any other popular frameworks without building anything yourself. There's no automatic right or wrong way here. It all depends on your infrastructure, 
capabilities, and use case. For quick experiments, GitHub integration or hub packages are great. For production workloads where you need maximum control, building your own image might make more sense. So now that we've got our requirements in place, we're ready to start creating our endpoint. Now that we're on the serverless screen, we'll see our listing of endpoints that we've already set up. So we'll click on New Endpoint to get going. The first option lets us scout out our linked GitHub account for repositories that we can pull in through the integration. From there, we can select a branch and any additional credentials if needed, like if we're pulling from private repos or need to access private packages. The second option lets you set up an endpoint from your pre-built Docker image. Generally, the most straightforward place to host is Docker Hub, but we do support AWS ECR or any other container registry capable of handling the authentication. Lastly, you can deploy pre-built packages from the hub. In this case, we'll select VLLM and paste in the hugging face path of our model. We're going to use a small Quen 2.5 0.5b model here. It's tiny, which is perfect for demonstrating concepts without waiting forever for things to load. And then we'll just hit next and then create endpoint. Once our endpoint is set up, we'll need to select our GPUs and do some other configuration. So we'll click manage and then edit endpoint to configure it. You'll see the listing of GPUs here, which are divided up by their VRAM, along with their prices per second on the right. The supply indicator in the middle shows you how much capacity is currently available across all regions. In this case, we'll work with just the 80 gigabyte Pro specs. The regular 80 gig specs are A100s, and the Pro specs are H100s, which are significantly faster for inference workloads. In fact, it's a good idea to benchmark your requested task against several different specs and compare the prices. The most cost-efficient spec isn't always the fastest or the slowest GPU. It all depends on execution time and how much that time costs. And that execution time can vary widely depending on what you're looking to do. You can also see the supply amount in the middle. Because we have all regions selected, this will likely look very green, but this may change if we select specific regions. If you need to restrict to a specific data center or geographic region, maybe for data compliance reasons or to reduce latency, you can do that here. For this example, we'll select just the Montreal data centers. And then when we scroll back up, we'll see just the supply for the data centers that we've restricted ourselves to. And lastly, if you want to fine tune the specific GPU models available, you can do that here at the bottom. This can be useful if you determine that one specific model GPU is best for your task, and you'd rather not involve other potentially suboptimal models. Finally, we'll save our config. Now, you'll see that since we made some changes to the endpoint, it'll give you a notification that these changes need to be rolled out. Any workers that were already spun up will be under the old configuration. Here's how rolling updates work. By default, the system replaces about 10% of your workers at a time, or at least one worker if you have a small fleet. Once a new worker finishes its cold start, the endpoint will prefer to send new requests to it. If an old worker is still processing a job, the system won't terminate it until it finishes that task. So it's not going to just drop your requests. If we want to hurry this process along, we can actually go to workers and manually terminate all the workers on the old version. This forces an immediate refresh, which is finer development, but of course you want to be more careful in production. Now that that's done, we'll wait for our worker under the new version to finish spinning up. You can go to the worker and click on logs to see how it's doing. You'll see the Docker container starting up, dependencies loading, and the model being loaded into VRAM. So we'll go into requests and click run to submit a test request, but we'll see that's just spinning. This is a very small model on a very fast GPU, so why is it taking so long? This is what is known as a cold start. Because there's only one worker set up and it's still booting up, that request is going to sit in a queue until there's a worker available to take it. You can't completely avoid cold starts. They're the trade-off that you make for not paying for idle capacity. However, once a worker is warm, then the next request will be picked up almost instantaneously. We'll get into cold start mitigation strategies in a future video. Things like keeping workers active, optimizing your Docker image size, and proper scaling configuration. But it's important to understand why they occur so you can design your application around them.
However, once a worker finishes booting, the results will display and that worker is now ready to immediately handle any requests that come in. You can see from the response time that the actual inference time was just milliseconds. All of that waiting before was a cold start and not the actual process itself. In the next video, we'll dive into API integration, how to actually call these endpoints from your applications, how to retrieve results from the status API, and the differences between run endpoints and load balancer endpoints.